Hey there, welcome to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me Dr. Christine Schaffner, who is a board-certified naturopathic physician and the clinic director of Sophia Health Institute, which is the clinic she co-created with her mentor, mentor, Dr. Dietrich Klinghart, in Woodenville, Washington. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was going to say Woodville, but it's Woodenville. Uh, she is also the host of the new Body Electric Summit, which uh, covers a lot of really fascinating science. Uh, I'm a speaker in the summit. Thank you, by the way, for, for having me on. And uh, we're going to get into a lot of really cool kind of cutting edge science uh, in this podcast with hopefully a whole bunch of stuff that most people have never heard of. So welcome to the show, Dr. Schaffner. Such a pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you, Ari. I'm really excited to have this conversation. And thanks again for also being part of the summit. Your your talk was one of my favorites. So thank you. Thank you. Cool. That's good to hear. <laughs> um, so body electric. Yeah. For There's probably a lot of people listening who have, first of all, no idea that that's kind of a reference to, there was a book titled The Body Electric, maybe 20 years ago. Is it that old? Longer uh, even. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there's kind of this whole concept around like the body's bioenergy fields and various kinds of, let's call them more broadly, like energetic inputs into our biological system, into our body that can affect the way our, our cells and our metabolism functions in all kinds of, in all kinds of ways. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'll, I was going to name off a bunch of stuff, but I'd rather just have you kind of explain the way that you conceptualize this broad picture of kind mm-hmm. of what, it, what does the body electric mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think um, I had an understanding before I did all these interviews and now I have a certain, you know, deeper understanding and a desire to go even further in. And, you know, this inspiration for this summit, you know, came out of at Sophia. I work with Dr. Klinghart and we see a lot of patients who've seen like so many doctors they've been through, you know, hell and back and they've just been sick for way too long. And, you know, one of his reflections that he's taught me over the years is that, you know, to really heal and recover from uh, chronic illness the people who really get better are not only the people who use, um, you know, principles and treatments that employ biochemistry, which I think we're really good at. I mean, I think that we've gotten a deeper understanding. I mean, there's so much in the functional medicine world and areas of detoxification and, you know, the supplement industry and the, you know, diet industry. I and mean, we, we know we have a lot of tools in that toolkit and people have usually exhausted a lot of those by the time they come and see us. And his comment was that when you combine really good Good biochemistry with good biophysics, and we didn't want to call the summit by the biophysics summit because that might <laughs> not be as um, you know uh, that might be a scary you know topic for some people. But when we employ those two um, understandings of how the body communicates, that people really heal. And so, um, Dr. Klinghart's from Germany. In Europe, I've been able to go to um, Medicine Week a handful of times, which is this wonderful medical conference in Baden-Baden, and um, there's um, this wonderful um, vendor exhibit, and there's so many different devices and tools, and you know, it's just like um, kind of Disneyland if you like those types of things. And um, why I'm saying that is in Europe, they're a lot more comfortable. The Russians and the Germans have done a lot of studying on this electromagnetic energy um, that we emit from our body, and you know, they have different device, devices to either measure or balance. And so that's a comfortable conversation in Europe. And then um, they actually don't have as many supplements. Supplements are really tightly regulated, so people are more going to be drawn to those types of tools and therapeutics when they're going to alternative medicine. And then in the U.S., you know, we have all of these supplements, um, but we don't have a, a really deep conversation about biophysics. And so the Body Electric Summit, you know, I just wanted to have this conversation and just share with people, especially who are struggling out there, that there are all these other tools that you might want to try um, so we can accelerate and amplify your body's ability to heal. So when we talk about the body electric, um, one of the things I always like to remind people is that this is not a woo idea. It's actually grounded in science. We know that we have a strong electromagnetic field that is generated from our heart. We measure that with an EKG in conventional medicine. We also have brain waves, you know, from our brain, you know, that get measured from an EEG. So conventional medicine 
knows this and uses different tools to measure these electrical aspects of our of our body. And um, you know, one of the speakers, I don't know if you know her, Ari, Dr. Rubik, but she um, is one of these biophysicists from you know Berkeley, and she's one of these frontier scientists. And she actually uh, coined the term biofield and actually put that in um, in PubMed in, in the 1990s, mm. so we could actually have an area of research that could develop around these concepts of this electromagnetic field that um, we have around our body. And so when we talk about the biofield, because I think the body electric, you have to have this conversation around this biofield. And so she talks about it as this um, electromagnetic field that surrounds our body. Um, and then a lot of the speakers have this um, you know, different way of kind of, I'm going to just really dumb it down and distill this information that I got from this, um, that this electromagnetic field that surrounds our body, it's not just this kind of random field that's generated from our body, but it actually has a property of where it actually instructs and informs our physical body um, to regulate. So it's almost has this mm, blueprint like nature to regulate our um, physical body and for our biochemistry to actually work correctly. And so again, dumbing down this conversation really simplistically, um, you know, health and um, health is a result of coherence. And what coherence means is just think of, you know, flow, organized energy. So when we have coherence in our biofield, we tend to be healthier and our body communicates on a cellular level better. But when we have incoherence or just think about disharmony and um, there are um, lots of speakers how, how, who have a lot of different ideas of what that means and how that um, you know, comes to be even um, conversations around trauma and how trauma can affect our you know, biofield and can affect our physical body. And so, so it was a really you know, fun you know, conversation to have with a number of speakers who talk about this conceptual framework and also tools and therapeutics and modalities that some um, speakers use day in and day out to treat patients with quite you know, fascinating results. And so, um, so yeah, so I, when I think about the body electric, I think about this electromagnetic energy that we have surrounding our body. And then I really love Beverly's work and I, I really resonate with her descriptions and her understanding and she's dedicated her life to trying to, um, you know, have a language around this and have science to support, you know, this aspect of our, our nature. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff. So uh, I'll tell you my big question in, in all this. So let's say we know that there's a bio field mm -hmm. um, and we know, for example, there's an electromagnetic field around the heart or around the brain mm -hmm. um, or around our body more broadly how do we know what is the the sort of layers of evidence that would allow us to know whether this is cause of health problems or whether this is an effect of health problems or whether it's just an epiphenomenon something just just is there but is not really relevant in dictating our health in any profound way so what what is the like what is the evidence to show that this is really important in our in our health I think it's a great question and a question that I'm pondering, especially I've been doing this for nine years. Um, uh, it's a long time, but not a long time. And, you know, I'm always trying to think about how can I um, make my patients' treatments more elegant and how I can get them better faster. And if I'm missing something or if I added something in, you know, more, you know, sooner in the, their treatment strategy, would they get better faster? So I come to this summit and these conversations kind of with that thought in mind. And one of um, the speakers, Speakers is Lynn McTaggart, and she actually wrote a book called *The Field*. Um, and she's an investigative journalist, and she, you know, really is kind of a was a naysayer in a lot of ways. But she, you know, came through her solid investigation and study of these concepts of the field, kind of a, a believer in this aspect of science. And she actually, her conversation in the book or in the summit rather is around her book called *The Power of Eight, and kind of when you get a group of collective people um, focusing on one thing, how she sees all these kind of, um, really, we can't make sense with our, our mind, you know, how people have these kind of healings or effect in their body. So going back to your question, I, I've been reading her book over and over again. And, you know, she really kind of looks at what is the evidence of these energies and how they influence their body. And um, there's a doctor, Dr. Fritz Albert Pop. I don't know if you've introduced um, him to your audience at this time, but I haven't. I, I, I don't know a whole lot about him, but I've definitely heard the name. 
Yeah, so he, um, he's a German um, biophysicist who came up with this biophoton theory idea. That's so he, right, yeah. yeah, so he came up with this idea, and Dr. Klinghart really bases a lot of his concepts of um, how he treats people with this understanding and how all living organisms and our cells actually emit a low, weak level of light. And so he also was able to demonstrate um, you know, um, patients who had cancer had, you know, not enough light in their body, but patients who had MS actually had too much light. So like mm. any health concept, it's like that middle path, right? You know, we want this kind of balanced amount of light. And so why I'm referencing him in your, your question is because, you know, really his research was around that question. And it seemed again, um, you know, I, I can't quote like a paper, but he has like over 150 on this topic that, really the light um, is not just this kind of um, offshoot or like this luminescence that the um, you know cells emit but it has an organizing um, factor and it actually affects um, cellular communication and even he went into studying um, our DNA and how our DNA actually emits light and how that's part of its regulatory mechanism um, having proper light emissions to instruct and inform our genetic expression so again I'm not an expert in this topic but there's enough clues for me to kind of start thinking about the body in this way and to you know go deeper and a lot of you know when we are in you know the platforms that we you and I both are, you know, um, you know, these, uh, the people who are typically in the research aspects in the universities, they're not, you know, big marketers or on podcasts or, you know, so you have to go look for this information a little bit more. But um, if this is a topic someone is wanting to go deeper into the science, I think um, Lynn did a really good job in her book, The Field, and she actually goes through this whole story and, you know, this development of research that, um, paints the picture that this is something that we should pay attention to and it's not this random you know a part of our body but this is the way our body communicates and this is also how we're interconnected um, you know with each other and if you want to take it a step further with the planet and so um, you know it has that potential to I, I just watched the movie uh, Avatar for the second time I hadn't seen it in many years but it kind of, it's it does a great job I think of kind of visually depicting Mm -hmm. this 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 kind of concept of like these direct connections mm -hmm. and they even do it as sort of things lighting up mm -hmm. um, and, and like sort of a bioluminescence effect is, mm -hmm. is often there in the, mm -hmm. in, the uh, in in the mm -hmm. in the movie or like kind of almost like neuron connections but they kind of show the electrical activity like connection between the, the avatar creatures and the uh, the navi people and the and the animals or the Navi people and direct in, in the earth and kind of the trees and, and things like that. And it, I mean, it's obviously a, a very beautiful world and mm -hmm. um, there seems to be definitely more science emerging showing that some of those layers are, are real. Mm -hmm. um, we just can't visualize them in those, those ways that we can when we're, we're watching a movie. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, not necessarily all of them. Like you can't hook your threads up to you know your neurons like to the tree of souls and and kind of connect directly with all of your ancestors and have them talk to you um but i think there's some some layers of this kind of this world that that have relevance to what science is now discovering about this whole body electric mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah um, no, i absolutely agree mm -hmm. yeah so um what are some of the devices that uh, that you're? Oh, you know, actually, before we get there, I, I, I'm just, I was trying to remember what I was going to say before I thought of the avatar thing, which is um, my next book is actually going to be on light. So my last book was on red and near infrared light therapy. Um, my next one's going to be on light more broadly, and basically an entire picture of all of the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. through all of the known mechanisms as of 2019, I'm sure we'll discover more, mm -hmm. uh, that light interacts with our body, with our cells, with our skin, with mm -hmm. neurotransmitter pathways and you know, all kinds of pathways. And as, I, as I've been digging into the science really in depth over the last year, very obsessively, it's, it's so cool to dig into this because I'm just discovering all of these mechanisms of mm -hmm. how light interacts with our body that really no one knows about. So as one example, like um, 
or very few people know about, I should say. So, uh, you know, ultraviolet light interacts with our skin. Everybody knows about vitamin D, but there's also something called cholesterol sulfate, which kind of, um, there's research to suggest it builds negative charge on our red blood cells, which helps, you know, blood to flow more freely as the, the red blood cells kind of repel one another as opposed to clumping together. And that obviously leads to um, lower blood viscosity and better oxygen delivery. And then, you know, there's, there's layers of this story where it directly impacts neurotransmitters in the brain or it impacts um, various neurotransmitters and, and other chemicals in the skin pathways. So for example, beta endorphin levels um, get increased through that they get produced in the skin in response to sunlight, which then gets into your bloodstream and interacts with your brain. We also can produce serotonin in our skin, which gets into our bloodstream and interacts with our brain. And, and, um, you know, red and near-infrared light and circadian rhythm pathways. I mean, it's just this rich story. And, yeah. and as you build it out more and more, you realize that our bodies are, are you know, extremely sensitive and responsive to all these different light wavelengths, these nutrients of light in yeah. way more profound ways than most people realize. Mm -hmm. um, there's all these layers of mechanisms of, of how our body's responding to light. So I think that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Biophoton stuff as far as, so everything I just said is light going into the body. Uh -huh. There's other side of things, which is like our cells actually producing light and communicating via light photons. That's always fascinating to me, but my attitude towards it is kind of like, it's still very much in its infancy. We don't really know what to do with any of that information or how to like modulate it to improve somebody's health in any profound way. But I, I certainly uh, think it's fascinating I'm gonna, and I, I'm excited to see more developments in that area. But do you feel there's any, am I wrong? Is, is there any, um, anything that has developed thus far as of 2019 where we can modulate those, that biophoton system in any way that, that, does anything to, to, to change somebody's health? You know, I think it's a great question. And I think this is an area that we need to go deeper. And, you know, if I got like $100 million, this is kind of the research I would love to see and, um, you know, really be able to measure and see how therapeutic interventions change this. And so we can draw more conclusions. Um, with, you know, just to kind of echo what you're saying, I, I love that you're writing this book because that's one of the most exciting modalities that I really am excited about in our practice. Um, we have a couple people talking about light and different applications of light. One of the most exciting um, applications that we're using at Sophia is something called photodynamic therapy, where we're actually using intravenous light, or if you can't um, do um, IV therapy, you can use acupuncture. Um, application with different um, colors or different wavelengths of light, right? So either red, um, yellow, blue, green, even UV or infrared. And that application has a known biological effect, which I'm sure you're going deeper in to understand about, you know, the receptors in the mitochondria that respond to light and how that can, you know, turn on, you know, cellular respiration. And, you know, we have Dr. Pollock, um, you know, who's on the summit. And um, I think it's such um, a beautiful kind of way to kind Kind of look at the body of how um, when we have more infrared light or even um, sunlight, right? You know, how that increases our exclusion zone water, which I know you talk a lot about. And I, I honestly, um, the more I dive into this concept of exclusion zone water, I feel like, you know, health is really an outcome of how much exclusion zone water we have built up in our cells and whether that is um, yeah, whether we have enough of that, you know, or not, because that's going to help maintain our charge and our um, cells' ability to exclude things out of our cells. So, not to go let's, down that path. Let me yeah, let me interrupt you there, because yeah. um, most people listening to this podcast probably haven't heard me talk about that subject, and I haven't mm -hmm. had Gerald Pollock on the podcast yet. So, I'm going to rely on you right now <laughs> to explain exclusion zone water and and what it is and why it's important or why. It's still obviously very early in the research um, as far as the implications for human health specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I do think that there's going to, it will turn out that there's definitely something to this concept, mm -hmm. um, especially given what I know about, for example, the effects of sunlight and saunas. Um, mm -hmm. I think at least one of the mechanisms that that's working through is probably this uh, easy exclusion zone water. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. can you explain the concept and, and why yeah. it relates to, or why we think it might relate to human health? 
Yeah, absolutely. I'll do my best to explain it. And so Gerald Pollack, he actually lives in Seattle and has become a friend of the clinic. And we um, have been introduced to this idea a few years ago when we met him and just trying to think about applications and if this actually changes the way people feel and maybe also thinking about therapeutics a little bit differently, like the infrared sauna, why it might be working. And I can share a little bit more about that. But this exclusion zone water or easy water or the fourth phase of water is this um, water that basically organizes itself around the cell membranes and it's this um, charge buildup. So um, we have H2O and uh, exclusion zone water is H3O and so it has this extra hydrogen that um, develops in the organization and it kind of when you look at and I suggest you Google or kind of look at a diagram but it's this organized almost um, crystalline structure um, that the water um, takes and it kind of layers and sheets along the membrane and it has all these exciting properties that Jerry's trying to you know tell us about so he actually thinks that the exclusion zone water inside the cell is what maintains the cell charge so when you go to medical school or you study physiology um, we're taught that the sodium potassium pump is actually what maintains our negative 70 millivolts within you know the cell um, but he's saying you know let's look at the charge buildup is actually with how much um, exclusion zone water is actually inside the cell and so um, and not to go down this road but Dr. Cowan is actually on the summit and he kind of takes this a, a little bit further and talking about how he feels like this cytoplasm um, the the exclusion zone water in the cytoplasm is very important to um, the health of the cell but so so this this is a natural occurring phenomenon, but it can occur um, with different inputs and occurs more readily. So infrared, which you talk a lot about and you can get infrared from you know, the sunlight, um, that, that actually creates more of this exclusion zone water in the body. And this charge buildup not only um, maintains the health of the cell, but it has this, um, and you already touched on this, this propulsion-like effect in the body. So it really helps with blood flow. And Jerry always talks about the microcirculation in the capillary bed. And you know when he thinks about the hemodynamics of blood flow in the capillaries, um, and so does Dr. Cowan talks about this. There's something else, you know, behind the propulsion, and you know, in these small spaces in the body, Ra and rather so, than just the action of the heart pumping yeah, at a distance, yeah. Yeah. pumping these fluid through miles yeah. and miles and miles. Of, of vessels. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so I, you know, so I think about, okay, health is exclusion zone water. Maybe we're disconnected from, you know, healthy light or kind of the natural rhythms of the day. And that's, you know, building that up in the body. And then um, I also think that our environment and the things that build up in our tissues and inside our cells and the extracellular matrix have an, um, a blocking effect to create more exclusion zone water in the body. And Dr. Cowan goes into that a little bit. And, um, you know, there's different charges on heavy metals and you know, glyphosate and all of that, how that kind of um, gets, you know, can disrupt that environment and can maybe decrease our, our body's ability to make exclusion zone water in different tissues. And so, yeah. so I think one tactic to, um, and I hate kind of using this word, I'm going to use it loosely, to detoxify our body um, could be, you know, how do we, you know, we might not be able to get all of this out, but one way to kind of combat that is building up more exclusions on water so our body can, um, you know, recalibrate given all the stresses that we're up against. So I don't know if I did a good enough job on that, but that's my, yeah. my construct of, you know, the yeah. fourth piece of water. I think you did a great job. Um, one interesting aside on this, I don't know if you're familiar with Gilbert Ling's work, but you know, um, I was just listening to Jerry talk about um, Gilbert. With is he the yeah Jer Gerald potassium? Pollock references Gilbert? Yes, Lane, yeah, right sodium there. potassium pump guy or yes, yeah, he did a lot of work around that exactly. And <laughs> um, as you said, you know, the, in in biology, you learn that kind of these gradients of ions across the cell are maintained by these ion pumps. Um, mm -hmm. It's the sodium potassium pump, but there's actually, um, as Gilbert Ling showed, that in order to maintain gradients of all these other ions that we know have gradients across the cell, you'd need a whole bunch of other pumps, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. And um, he actually did the math and calculated mm -hmm. if this were true, if we had these sort of ion pumps for all these different ions that are responsible for maintaining these ion gradients uh, in the intracellular and extracellular environments, it would be 
um, if I, I'm, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but it's something like orders of magnitude high. It would require orders of magnitude higher calorie intake mm -hmm. than, uh, than we actually eat in an entire day. So in other words, all of the calories of all of the food that you eat would do nothing other than just maintain these ion gradients, just maintain the, the ion gradients in your cells. They wouldn't be able to power any other function in your body. And even just to maintain that, it would require orders of magnitude more food intake each day to maintain that. So what he's getting across is there's some other force that is working to maintain these ion gradients of things like calcium and sodium and potassium and other ions mm -hmm. in the cell and outside the cell. Uh, there's something that's working to maintain those gradients more passively that doesn't require, you know, ATP production. Uh -huh. And um, basically that there's a gel, like basically like a viscous gel-like layer of water close to the membranes, mm -hmm. um, which is exactly what Gerald Pollack would predict based on his work, um, that itself kind of creates separation of charge and kind of repels a lot of these ions. So it just the, the, the chemical nature of that water um, basically passively maintains a lot of these gradients so that we don't have to consume thousands of calories each day just to maintain our, our cells in this, these, with these ion gradients. So right. I just thought that was an interesting kind of layer to the story. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Dr. Klinger actually interviewed Dr. Pollock in the summit, and they talk a lot about that, that the pump theory, there's just not enough, you know, it just is faulty, right? You know, so, and that's, that's the fun part of these conversations. And even the work that you're bringing to light is, you know, sometimes... Nice, nice pun, by the way. Yeah, I know. The work <laughs> I'm bringing to light. <laughs> that could be your tagline for your book. Yeah. I, I didn't even mean that, you know. Um, but, you know, my, my point is that sometimes we get so... Um, you know, just, we just get so, um, you know, we think that everything, we have everything figured out. And then, you know, what I always like to think about when I'm, you know, looking, um, at science and trying to, you know, prepare for lectures. I mean, we just found out about the glymphatic system in 2015 and then the interstitium a few years ago. And even that the mesentery was like a one continuous fold, you know, like these things that we think, you know, we have the body figured out. It's like, we don't, you and, know. And actually, did you just yeah. see, like, I think it was last week, there was a new study about the stress response. Um, I think it was, um, it's it basically showing that our bone is okay. in, integral to our body's stress response. And mm -hmm. it's not, for example, all about like our HPA axis system, but mm -hmm. um, people without any adrenals and without any cortisol can actually have a full-blown fight or flight stress response um, by, it's mediated predominantly by, I think it was osteocalcin, if I'm remembering the exact mm -hmm. compound that's secreted by bone tissue. So who would have thought that our skeletal structure is playing an, an integral role in our body's stress response? That's interesting because a lot of our, we see a lot of um, Lyme patients and patients who've been sick for a while and a lot of their parathyroid hormone can get dysregulated quite often and we just, you know, it's just an observation, but you know, this could, looking at that and maybe we can make more sense of why that tends to be a trend in our patients. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, I want to get into some of these other aspects of this whole body electric stuff. Talk to me about, uh, deuterium. Mm -hmm. So what, what is deuterium? What's the relevance of it in, in human health and, and mm -hmm. um, cellular function? Yeah, you know, this is an exciting topic. You know, we're start, still trying to figure out what to do with all of this information. Um, my good friend, Dr. Patrick Dorfsman, who's actually in Santa Monica, brought this you know, information to us, and she works closely with Dr. Boros and some of these researchers at UC, out of UCLA who are um, really diving into this um, full force and applying it to, um, you know, now more clinical settings. And so deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen, and so um, it's a naturally occurring um, isotope. So when we drink water, we always think we were, we're drinking H2O, but often we can be drinking D2O or DHO. Um, so it's uh, deuterium, which is a heavier um, it's going to be heavier um, in its nature than a hydrogen molecule. And so it's called heavy water often. And so um, how I've really oversimplified the deuterium story, because I've listened to a ton of people and trying to figure out how to make sense to all this, is that even though it's naturally occurring, 
um, it probably, we're probably getting more exposed to deuterium because of kind of maybe um, just changes in our environment or just modern life or what have you, that we're getting more exposed to deuterium than maybe we were meant to, meant to be. And then we, because it's naturally occurring, we have mechanisms in our body to, to deplete deuterium on a natural um, occurring basis, but those mechanisms often get blocked. And so we have this buildup of deuterium in our tissues. And basically why deuterium can be so problematic is that it actually affects our mitochondrial machinery to make ATP. And really um, where I'm still wrapping my head around this concept of really the, you know, we always think about the mitochondria making ATP, but it's also um, its job is to make metabolic water. And so um, how we can actually have the right water balance and you know probably it has to do with exclusion zone water somebody needs to look at all of this right you know but when um deuterium when we're overexposed to deuterium and that gets saturated in our tissues it can affect our um, cellular machinery and our mitochondrial function and then we get this um lowering of our energy um and lowering of you know, our metabolic water in our body. And so um, why this can be more of a conversation now is that there is a test that's available where you can um, look at your saliva and your breath um, levels of your deuterium and you can kind of see um, what your exposure is and how well you're getting rid of it. And then there's lots of different strategies around getting rid of it. Um, again, the practicality of all of this, I'm trying to figure out. Um, but if people are really suffering from a chronic illness, there's also cancer application. I don't treat cancer, but they do treat a lot of cancer patients because it does seem to be a part of the story. And that's a lot of Dr. Boros's work. Yeah. I, I actually just interviewed a cancer researcher and, okay. and he was talking about the the trials with deuterium depleted water and was, he, uh -huh. and he's very much like kind of a mainstream cancer researcher. He's not very yeah. alternative yeah. at all. Uh, and, and he was really impressed, blown away, I would even say by, uh, by the trials with deuterium depleted water. Yeah. And so basically, you know, what we're both saying is that you get your levels and if you're probably cancer or you have, or you're struggling, your your probably levels are tend to be pretty high and you're not getting rid of it. And so they give you the special water that's um, depleted of deuterium and then they measure per parts per million. And depending on how sick you are, kind of where, what they want to do, they'll, uh, for instance, have you drink a liter a day of 85 parts per million um, deuterium and so what that does is you're getting less exposure so your body can finally catch up and start depleting this and so that tends to naturally occur and then um you know jack cruz and these people talk also about you know how we have other ways to deplete deuterium by you know light is uh, one way that we can you know do that um and then I, I have some friends who are trying to think about supplements you know to deplete deuterium as well and i don't have any opinion on that but 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 um, why I'm so curious with this is because the results that she's um, seen and kind of what I continue to hear, it seems to be a piece of the story. And what the deuterium people are saying is, why don't you start there first instead of doing all this intervention? Why don't you kind of get someone's deuterium levels, you know, to, you know, where they should be? And then their body's going to function better and respond better to whatever you decide to do or just see how, how where their health is once their levels get better. Where so they're, they're so they're actually making the argument that deuterium is like maybe the most or one of the most critical mm -hmm. compounds in our cells that determines health more broadly. And yeah, or the overexposure of it is going to mm -hmm. destroy our health more than anything else that we're realizing because it's, um, you know, it's such a fundamental, it's, you know, everyone's talking about mitochondrial medicine, right? You know, mm -hmm. give them the carnitine, whatever, you know, but it's like, you know, it could be the deuterium that's really, um, you know, jamming up the mitochondria. And so, mm -hmm. so why I, why I'm like not completely sold on this idea yet is the water is really expensive. And so, um, how expensive know, is it by the way? I actually haven't looked, you know, it just depends, you know, don't quote me, but usually a month's supply is about a thousand dollars, you know? So it's, yeah. So yeah, it's just one of these things where, and it's hard, you know, again, when, you know, we're, change in a paradigm or a new science or modalities come out, they tend to be expensive. And then you kind of wait, you know, kind of like technology, like the iPhone, you know, it is, but it's, we're in that stage where it's still for me to recommend it to a patient. I have to kind of feel like they have the resources and the determination or we're out of options or we need to try something different. And so 
that's why I don't have like a huge, um, not a lot of patience on it, but it's yet, yet really, another reason to take care of your mitochondrial function and not get cancer in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. you know, and, um, you know, and so, I mean, that's so important. Um, but you know, I see people who live these wonderfully healthy life, um, lifestyles who still get sick, you know, so it's just, I think what we're up against environmentally is sometimes, you know, beyond, you know, what we probably all realize and, you know, the deuterium, you know, piece um, could be a result of also, you know, these environmental stressors that we're, we're up against too. Mm -hmm. Do yeah. you know of any, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned light um, yeah. I'm, I'm, and obviously healthy mitochondria deplete, yeah. actually work to deplete uh, deuterium at the cellular level. Mm -hmm. So um, healthy mitochondria, anything that feeds into healthier mitochondria, um, mm -hmm. sunlight exposure, are there any other strategies that you're aware of that are very effective other than like the very expensive you drinking deuterium depleted water, but anything yeah. to help our cells deplete deuterium? Yeah. You know, they talk a lot about dietary strategies and more of like the keto or fat based diet is going to be our body is actually going to make more metabolic water out of that, um, out of fat. And so they feel like that's also another strategy there. There's a list. I mean, again, I'm not doing this all day long. I just wanted to kind of share this information to, cause I think, I think we're going to be hearing about it more and more and I want people to be educated so they can make an opinion. Mm -hmm. But, um, but there is like a list of like, you know, things to do to kind of optimize, but depending on where your health is and how high your levels are, you might just decide to drink the water. <laughs> gotcha. yeah. um, so I want to switch to other devices. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to say also on this topic of, um, the whole body of bio, bio, bioelectric fields. Uh -huh. I, I have some, as you know, as we were talking about before we started recording, uh, I, I have some reservations about some aspects of it because I think on the one hand, there's a lot of science that's really fascinating stuff and like uh -huh. stuff that's in its infancy. The biophoton stuff is fascinating. Deuterium uh -huh. is fascinating. Um, you know, microcurrents and, you know, a lot of layers of quantum biology uh, that are being built out right now, I think are really fascinating. But I think uh, there's also some, unfortunately, some uh, people in this industry that are kind of like hijacking some of this research and then making all kinds of really wild claims mm -hmm. uh, to support, all, you know, whether they're selling a device or various methods. And they're trying to kind of ground it in some of these quantum ideas, this quantum weirdness, and kind of claim this is the next generation of medicine, and it's really cutting edge and things like that. Mm -hmm. And when, when, in fact, I see a lot of people out there who are really just selling pseudoscience, they're selling nonsense and snake oil. And, uh, and so my feelings, I mean, really the reason that I haven't done a podcast on this area is because mm -hmm. I'm so wary of... Mm -hmm people getting misled and then, you know, getting kind of scammed. Um, yeah. So having said that, I'm curious, do you feel, you know, you, you mentioned at the beginning of this interview that you do think there's some devices out there yeah. that uh, are useful. What are the devices that you think um, have really good evidence to support them and are, and are actually useful? Yeah, no, and I appreciate your perspective because I think, you know, when people are vulnerable and they might, you know, we both have studied science for a long time and to be able to make opinions, right? And so when people are vulnerable or, you know, just really, um, you know, wanting a quick fix or, you know, um, they're really, um, you know, there are people, unfortunately, in the space who can take advantage um, of that. And so I, I think, you know, always you know trying to get a perspective and you know as much information before you um try something and you know as a doctor i'm always like do no harm right so i want to and in my position where i sit in that where i have a patient population who've been failed by so many things that they're so open and maybe more open than they ever would have been if they hadn't gone through that experience so so i i feel blessed in that sense that when i, I when patients come to us they're looking for an alternative approach because they you know they've been to the mayo clinic they've been to the cleveland clinic they conventional medicine has had a, a chance to cure them and hasn't and so so i think you know we're we're being asked to like look at this paradigm differently and look at different tools and strategies and so with that being said some of the things um, that we use at the clinic and that i do feel 
you know, um, we have speakers, um, you know, speaking about this. I, I mentioned the photodynamic therapy. That's something that we just got this last year. So it's um, in its infancy at our clinic, but so far the results are quite fascinating. And I, I don't know if this is um, something that you've um, come across with your research and in your book, but this concept of we will have this laser application and then you can take things that are naturally what we call photosensitizers. So mm -hmm. it's this beautiful mechanism in the body that um, cells that are all more damaged actually are going to take up um, these photosensitizers more readily, so they're going to be more um, susceptible to the light application therapy. And Dr. Weber, if he's in Germany, he's the um, the guy who created this device and has a textbook on all of this. If you want to learn more, so yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm interested in that topic. I've definitely read a few papers on it here and there, but I'm definitely not an an expert in it. But mainly, what I've seen is I've actually kind of been um, almost afraid of even trying anything like that because. Um, I like getting lots of sun exposure and light exposure. And I, I don't want, if, you know, you start getting into these photosensitizers, which I've seen research, like what you're describing, like, for example, they'll use it to specifically photosensitize like tumor cells, cancer, and then shine bright light on the cancer. And you can, there's, I've seen amazing studies where they can actually kill the cancer by photosensitizing it and then shining light on it, which, which creates all these toxic, byproducts in the cell that kill the cancer. Okay. Um, and so I'm, I've been kind of just wary of that whole space of taking anything that might be a photosensitizer. Yeah, and I hear you, um, but curcumin actually is a naturally a photosensitizer. Um, yeah. And so there's some of these naturally, you know, occurring compounds. There are things like methylene blue and um, endocyathene green. I, it's I3C. I can't remember the exact term, but um, Dr. Weber, he treats a lot of um, cancer patients and he shows these really remarkable studies of um, the combination of photosensitizers and light application. He's sometimes using low dose chemotherapy or other interventions too. So it's not just this alone, but I, I went there to their conference um, in San Diego actually um, in the beginning of this year and I was just blown away and it's such a humble group of people too. So, you know, they're, they're really in it for the medicine and what I've seen. So light is absolutely something, you know, um, we're excited about and we use. Um, we also, we have a um, juve panel at the clinic and you talk about, you know, red light and, um, you know, infrared light and near infrared. And so that's something that I absolutely can stand by. Um, and then um, I don't know if you've talked to your community about frequency specific microcurrent, but I haven't, uh, no. So Dr. Carolyn McMakin, she is on the summit and she's she has a, um, a textbook and also, you know, uh, just a layman's book on this topic called The Resonance Effect. But she has this um, really beautiful career and study of a frequency specific microcurrent. So it's using a microcurrent technology and there's um, different frequencies to treat different um, tissues or organ systems or even pathogens in the body. And she has done her due diligence over the years to really see what the therapeutic effect and why this works. And she has some understanding. I think it's part of the understanding, but she can talk, document an increase in ATP production with the use of microcurrents. So kind of um, increasing cellular function. Um, but we, we use frequency specific microcurrent at the clinic and it's really good for concussions or head injuries to, you know, helping people's lymph drainage, you know, and these are kind of what I hear from a clinical experience. So um, she great, gave a great interview. Um, neurofeedback, I think is really exciting. Um, we have a couple different, um, we have one person who's talking about microcurrent biofeed or neurofeedback on the summit. Um, we have a technology at the office as well. And I, I still feel like there's so much room to use this therapy, um, you know, more strategically, but it's this idea of uh, mapping your, your brain and seeing where there might be underactive or overactive brain waves, and then using um, different um, neurofeedback devices usually that are um, EEG driven to kind of balance, um, you know, making, um, you know, just kind of restoring them to balance so they're not underactive or overactive. And that can help with um, everything from post-concussion syndrome to, um, you know, cognitive impairment. So I think that um, there's a lot of promise in that. I, why I'm kind of, I don't 
use it all the time, so I can't talk from my experience, but we, we talk about that and we share that information at the summit. Um, and then just as far as other modalities that piqued my curiosity, um, we have Dr. Gar Garcia. He's, he actually uses something called biomagnetism, so paired magnets with a positive or negative charge and how that can affect um, tissue pH and can kind of also, um, you know, help to upregulate the immune system or circulation and healing and um, organs that might be struggling. And so he had a really um, wonderful um, uh, lecture. And then, um, you know, in the realm of maybe esoteric, but what I see clinically to be true, there's this whole idea of um, trauma and um, emotions and how um, unhealed or unresolved trauma can affect our physical body. And so why that conversation is in the summit is because, um, you know, it, it's this kind of, we don't have a way of saying, oh, trauma affects, you know, um, you know, our mitochondria, right? You know, it's not in this biochemical model. So we know though that it has an impact on our, our, our feelings of well-being. I mean, time and like what my um, practice has shown me is when people look at these other aspects of their body. So Dr. Klinger calls it the five levels of healing, but there's just this idea that we're more than our physical body and this mind, body, spirit connection, if you want to just oversimplify it. But when people start to um, acknowledge and create healing around past traumas, their, their, their body can absolutely respond differently and they can, um, you know, get better faster. So I, I see that a lot. So we have different people talking about EFT, um, and different tapping modalities and breath work and, you know, all of that. So, um, so yeah, it's, you know, my goal was just to put this out there into the world. I mean, there is also this other conversation around EMF and how, um, EMF, you know, with our, um, you know, technology is wonderful that we're able to do this, these kind of talks and all of this, but we just have to understand, um, the, you know, this cumulative exposure. We're kind of in this uncharted territory of, you know, we haven't been in, you know, human history surrounded by this much exposure for this long without this many breaks. And um, yeah, actually, the, this, this was going to be my next question on. EMFs. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm glad you brought it up because my, right. my attitude towards it is, yeah. is, is, is basically that I feel I'm kind of just waiting for more science to mm -hmm. develop a strong opinion, because yeah. I, I feel like I've seen definitely some research suggesting harm. And then there's other research yeah. kind of and, and experts suggesting that it's it's really benign and and you know mm -hmm. all the concern over it is just is fear mongering and is not based okay. in science and um, I have I have not formed a, a strong opinion and I have not done a lot of um, of, um, of of speaking about this issue to mm -hmm. my audience and telling mm -hmm. them they need to go to great lengths to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, exposure to electromagnetic fields. Of course, I recommend some basic things like don't talk, you use your phone on a cell phone on speaker, have it on airplane mode if it's on your body, you know, mm -hmm. wire internet at home if possible, turn your Wi Fi off at night, things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I haven't really emphasized it because, mm -hmm. in the absence of evidence showing that it's really harmful, I'm actually more worried about like creating nocebo effects from. From yeah. telling people how harmful it is, so I'm just curious. Like that's kind of my attitude, but I'm I'm totally open to more evidence showing that it really is harmful, and we need to be really talking more about it. But what's what's your take on this? Yeah, you know, it's something that we feel pretty strongly at Sophia that we give people recommendations on, you know, safe uses of technology, and also, um, you know, how to mitigate and have a healthy home. I think we, I, I think you bring up a really great point. When you know, kind of what we both know, we can live in a world where it can be really scary out there and it can be really anxiety producing and that we know that our that can affect our physiology you know in a very negative way maybe more than actually what we're being afraid of so i, I think that there's that balance absolutely um but i want to of course empower people give them education what i've you know what i feel very strongly about knowing kind of the science which i'm happy to share is that we should all really strive to have a safe sleeping location. So we're not gonna be able to, you know, change the world yet, you know, with kind of how we maybe improve this technology or, you know, um, have different ways that we utilize it. But if the where I do think um, it just makes sense to me is that we don't have a break, you know, we're, we're constantly exposed and our sleep is so important for our brain's ability to heal and detoxify. So I recommend people measuring their, you know, where their bed is and measuring, um, 
their EMF exposure. So, um, you know, definitely turning off the Wi-Fi or not using that at bedtime. Um, knowing if you live near a cell phone tower um, or around neighbors who, you know, have a lot of Wi-Fi going on. So just knowing, you know, what your exposure is and then you can make, you know, recommendations. And so when we think about EMF, we think about cell phones, we think about Wi-Fi. We also think about dirty electricity and that can be more due, um, due to the wiring in your home. Um, and so what, what I've learned over the years, um, and there is science to, that's looking at it more in Europe, you know, than in here, but um, just to bring it back to the summit, Dr. Rubik talks about her study with 4G, not 5G, uh, wearable devices on people. And then she just looked at live blood cell and did show a significant um, low or clumpiness of the red blood cells, you know, with um, increased exposure um, over time. And so, so what that means is that um, that 4G or cell phones, when you're wearing them on your body, they can potentially be um, making your blood more coagulable and sluggish. And, you know, at the end of the day, health is blood flow, right? We need blood to, um, um, carry oxygen to our tissues and nutrients and get waste out. And so, so that was interesting to me, her study. Um, I always refer to Dr. Martin Paul and his research on looking at um, basically the voltage gated calcium channels and how um, EMF he's shown to make our cells more hyper excitable um, because of the influx of calcium. Again, we just had this conversation of exclusion zone water. So who knows, you know, <laughs> what's happening, but, um, but he, you know, he feels strongly and he's shown, he's shown on this and so um, you know it's affecting our neurons and nervous system um, you know there is an increase in brain tumors um, I have a you know PA who used to work with me who worked in a brain surgeon's office and there's no doubt I mean that is not debatable and the science is showing that we do have increases in brain tumors that I mean of course so we, just just to clarify that are you saying like increased rates of brain tumors in the population level compared to it, a couple of decades ago, or are you saying increased rates of brain tumors that we know are linked to like cell phone use? So, so my point is saying there's an increase, you know, in rates of brain tumors, you know, since past decades. But again, you know, of course it could be other factors, but it is highly, you know, suspicious, especially with a lot of these technologies being close mm -hmm. to the head and brain tumors, you know, developing around kind of where people tend to, you know, put their phones. And so again, there's a correlation, I'm not saying causation, but um, that's something to think about. Um, you know, things that have been interesting to me, I've seen um, studies that shown an increase in urinary excretion of melatonin with increased exposure to EMF. Oh, so I think, I yeah, that. yeah, I'll, I'll send the study to you um, okay. um, afterwards. And then um, there is, um, you know, I, I have, um, I'm just thinking because I know I have a PowerPoint on my desk with a bunch of studies that I could, you know, I still have my baby brain, my fourth dive before. I, I, you know, to, to, to that point, I, I have yeah. seen uh, yeah. two studies where they yeah. looked at EMF exposure uh, um, suppressing melatonin production yeah. and like measurable levels. I think they yeah. measured either in the, in the, I'm guessing in the blood. Uh -huh. um, Maybe it was the saliva, but I know that they showed suppressed melatonin. I hadn't seen what you're talking about, like increased urinary excretion of melatonin. Okay. Um, yeah. One quick aside that most people don't know, most people think of melatonin as uh, just a sleep hormone, yeah. um, but they don't realize that melatonin is actually one of the most, if not the single most powerful protector of your mitochondria. And so melatonin, I think, is a really big deal that doesn't get enough um, Where, focus. Yeah. I'm so glad you're saying that we're kind of down the melatonin rabbit hole at Sophia right now. And so, um, again, it's the circadian rhythm aspect, right, of melatonin, but it's also highly neuroprotective. It's been shown to get viruses and I think arsenic, cadmium, and mercury out of the brain. So it is one of the most powerful agents to actually detoxify the brain. So how elegant is the body, right? The lymphatic system works at bedtime and our brain actually so produces, you know, melatonin to not only put us to sleep, but also protect our brain. And then, um, you know, there's a lot of cancer studies and things. And so we're, we're playing around with not only liposomal oral uh, melatonin, but also transdermal melatonin creams and suppositories. And, um, you know, it's been rewarding so far. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So uh, I want to be sensitive to your time here. Um, we've covered a lot of really fascinating topics. I would love for you to wrap up with uh, maybe your top two or three kind mm -hmm. of big, big takeaways that you want people to come away from, from this with. 
and it yeah. can be things that you've already touched on or if you want to kind of um, bring any new ideas to the table. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. No, um, again, this was really a lot of fun for me. And I, it's really, um, really, you know, we teach sometimes what we want to learn, right? And so it's just to, um, really fascinated me. And I, I really want to go deeper in a lot of these conversations that I had. And so I'm really excited to see where this takes my knowledge, and then also, you know, my practice and how I can help patients better. So that that's just really what this is all about. And so with that being said, I mean, one of the, um, probably every speaker talked about grounding. And I, I do think that grounding is something that has probably a, a ton of effects, um, you know, that um, are, are really helpful. And it's something that's free that everybody can do. And so that's actually getting your bare feet in contact with the earth. The idea is that you're getting um, electrons from the earth, and that's actually helping for your body to deal with all of the um, free radical stress. So free radical stress is usually an unpaired electron. So you're getting more electrons, you know, through this contact with the earth and that can help you withstand the, you know, stresses of modern life. And it, it's known to make people feel more relaxed and, you know, connect with nature. And I, I think that that's all positive. So I think that grounding is something we all have access to. Um, and then I would say, um, you know, the water conversation was fun. You know, I, I still, you know, it's still impractical and probably too expensive, but if I could put in a nutshell, what I've learned about water is of course, we want to filter it, get the fluoride out, get the aluminum out of the water, get the glyphosate and the, you know, all the things that we can. And then, you know, the other conversation is maybe get the deuterium levels under 130, you know, parts per million. Um, by, the, by the way, there, there, there is, uh, I was talking about the cancer researcher just uh, yesterday when I interviewed him, but he said there's a bunch of actually like uh, do-it-yourself deuterium depletion videos for how to deplete water at home of deuterium, oh, um, which involves like freezing it and then scraping the layers okay. of ice off the top. Um, it, it's so it sounds like appealing in the in the one sense that it's do it yourself at home deuterium depletion so it saves you a lot of money yeah. on the other hand it sounds extremely time intensive and tedious Absolutely, absolutely. And so I know at least, I mean, and this is the hack, right? The more we get people thinking about this, someone's going to figure this out even in a more elegant way, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like, okay, getting that and depleting the deuterium. And then, um, you know, potentially we did talk about hydrogen water. So that's an idea. So maybe adding the hydrogen in and structuring it so there's more exclusion zone water so right that would be the perfect drinking water so again it's not practical at this point but it, um you know just how can you maybe start implementing some of this um some of these things i think is important and then really you know again the message Ari, is if you're struggling out there um really you know i want you to know that there is a whole toolkit you know with a um you know with hopefully having a trusted you know practitioner or physician to help guide you and help you make the right choices for you but you know i'm i'm kind of at that point of my life where i've seen a lot of people struggle and it's been you know i of course i see patients get better and it's so rewarding but it's it takes too long and it's too hard and so how can we maybe employ these thoughts and these concepts so we can create really a more elegant path for healing for for our patients beautiful Dr. Schaffner, I have really, really, really enjoyed this conversation. This was a lot of fun, and we we covered a lot of really cool, um, unusual, novel, cutting edge topics. Um, I'm I'm super excited to like have you on again in a year or two, uh, as this whole field of research continues to evolve. As you seem to to have a unique interest and to be on the leading edge of it. So, um, thank you so much for coming on the show and and having this very fun conversation with me. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Ari. I really appreciate your time and your support and your participation. And I would be, I would love to see where I go down this rabbit hole in a year and reconnect. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Where can people follow your work, Dr. Schaffner, or reach out to you if they want to work with you uh, in person? Great. Well, thank you. So um, I work at Sophia Health Institute and that's sophiahi.com. And I have a, we have a wonderful team of um, practitioners and naturopaths and medical doctors. And, um, you know, so check us out there. And then I also have a website, drchristineschaffner.com. I have a podcast. I'd love to have Ari on. And I um, know I um, just everything I'm doing is kind of located in that one site as well. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, doctor. I, I mispronounced your last name there. Um, it's okay. it's, it's, no. Is it Schaffner rather than Schaffner? Yeah, it's Schaffner. Yeah. So okay. um, it's my married name. It's what they tell me, you know, how to say it. So okay. <laughs> perfect. Thank you again and look forward to connecting again very soon. Thank you.
Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. Hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.